Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What's your greatest fear? Maria Stenwinkel, a corporate consultant from Sweden, asked 65 people from around the world, what is your greatest fear in life? Now, you might expect uh, people mention things like you know, fear of dying alone or losing their job. You know, I was wondering, actually, if anybody said bugs. <laughs> I was talking to someone earlier this week who's very afraid of bugs. Anyway, uh, in Sten Winkel's survey, this is interesting, more than one in every five people expressed a, a different fear from any of those. Greatest fear? Living a life without purpose or meaning. Listen to their own words. Uh, Anthony from New York City said, my biggest fear is never taking a risk in an effort to find my true calling. Rebecca from Stuttgart said, my greatest fear is to go through life living small but not realizing it till it's too late. Danielle from Sacramento said, my greatest fear would be missing out on my purpose here on earth. I know I have a purpose that I'm not yet serving. Luciana from Sintra in Portugal said, to go through life without leaving a positive mark. And Ralph from North Brunswick said, my greatest fear is regretting all that I didn't do as I lay in my hospital bed as an elderly man. We need our lives to have purpose and meaning. And most people know implicitly that that doesn't mean riches and pleasures. Somehow, it's about love. It's what Jesus taught and modeled. Life should be about love. But love, the real thing, it doesn't just moon around sighing and looking out the window. It does things. What? When Jesus wanted to show his disciples what love does, he got down on the floor and washed their feet. Who does that? That's what real love does. Jesus served them. He lowered himself and raised them up. And the day after that, he served again, served you and me and the world by suffering in our place, going down into death on a cross. God demonstrated his love for us. Jesus served us with his life. Love serves. If you're going to live a life of meaning, you're going to have to plug into this love that serves. As a church, we're currently in a 40-day teaching series, a 40-day challenge to serve like Jesus. It's getting us connected with our purpose for being here on earth. You may say, uh, I don't think that I've got much to offer. What can I do for others that's of any use to them? I'm just a regular person. Well, today we're going to look at a scripture which talks about what you do have to offer. It's Matthew 25, 14 to 30. We heard it a moment ago. A story that I'm going to call the parable of the bags of gold. Let's go through it a bit at a time. Okay, so Jesus started off saying, For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. The master entrusts his wealth to the servants. Now that sounds strange to us, because first of all, there's, <laughs> there's nobody in our lives that we call servants, nobody. Even if you have a cleaning lady or someone who cuts your grass, you don't call them servants. And even though they're probably very nice, you certainly do not entrust your wealth to them. So the background of this parable, very different from our own culture, <clears throat> because in the society where Jesus taught, all of that did go on. Those servants were, in fact, slaves. There were slaves in that society, and lots of them. And they often rose to positions of great influence and responsibility. So it did not sound weird to the people who first heard this that the master entrusted his property to them. And in Jesus' parable, the master represents God. The servants are you and me. Which brings us to the first surprising observation. God trusts you. God trusts you. Here's what I want to ask. Does God trust you more than you trust you? Too many of us can be so negative or doubtful of ourselves. 
And yet you have a God. You have a God who's willing to give something of value to you, willing to entrust, in terms of his story, his wealth to you. That's wild. But you, you push back. Why would God give something of value to me? How, how could God trust me after all the ways I've failed? Okay, listen to this example. There was a young man who was hired as a junior executive at a big company. As I recall, it was Ford. Could be wrong, but I think it was Ford. Anyway, he had to manage a number of people and a $5 million budget. He threw himself into it, but some key mistakes were made, and after a time, his project went belly up. Ashamed, he prepared to resign and hand his boss a letter. What's this? His boss asked. A letter of resignation, the young man said. I figured I'd resign before you fire me. Fire you, the boss said. No way. I just spent $5 million to train you. <laughs> Friends, <laughs> we have sinned and we have failed. There's no doubt. But the Lord God does not wash his hands of you and me. No way. He's committed to your ongoing development. His idea is that we'd learn from our sins and failures. And the biggest lesson, listen to this, the biggest lesson is this, to trust in Christ and not ourselves. First, trust him for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. But more, more. Trust his word and his personal commitment to you as he now entrusts you like that master entrusted his servants with valuable assignments, with a mission in your life to serve. And there's more that Jesus' parable shows us. In the story, we're the servants entrusted with good works, which God really wants done. And for this, for this, he does not leave us empty-handed. It's not like he gives us these assignments, but not the resources to actually get them done. No. The truth is, God invests in you. He trusts you, and then he invests in you. Check it out. Verse 15. It says, To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now, I expect you may have problems with what I just read there, because uh, when we read it earlier out of the bulletin, this verse didn't say anything about bags of gold. The word instead was talents. That is the word in the original, talents. Well, what's a talent? I'll tell you what it's not. It's, it's not the ability to tap dance or sing. A talent in the New Testament, in those times, was a unit of money. Oh yeah, how much? Well, you might imagine a talent was around 10 bucks or $100 or even $1,000, something in that range. You'd be way out. A talent equal to 6,000 denarii. One denarii was the amount paid for one day's labor. Okay, then let's do some math and put this into a modern equivalent. For the sake of argument, let's assume that today a laborer is paid $20 an hour. Now that could be low or that could be high depending on the work, but let's just go with 20. So a day's work, eight hours, would be $160. That's the equivalent of one denarii. A talent was 6,000 of those, making how much? $9,600, or should we just call it a million? In the story then, the master invests an enormous amount of money in each of his servants. Like, I, I mean, even in that culture, one whole talent of gold was an eye-popping amount to invest in a servant. A huge, huge sum. But this story is really about the magnitude of the investment that God has made in you. He has not left you empty-handed. God has invested hugely in you so that you can produce a return for him, a return of service to your fellow man. This, this God really values and wants to see. All right, then. What, what specifically has God invested in you? Well, it's everything. There's nothing you have that he didn't give you and give you for a purpose. Uh, do you have, for example, feet? Do you have feet? 
Did you give them to yourself? No. Well, you were able on those feet to walk over, to walk across the room, to walk across the street, and get involved in situations that God cares about. You could sit in your chair and not do anything, but you've got feet. You can do this. You've been given them. A great many of you have a car. This expands the reach and scope of the good you can do dramatically. Your car also is God's investment in you. Your possessions are. Then there's your abilities. You've got the ability to speak and carry on a conversation. That means you're able to express neighborliness. You could never talk to your neighbors, but you've got a voice. You can do this. Express neighborliness you can, and care for people. It's amazing what a word of care and neighborliness does. It also means that you can tell them the good news about Jesus. Words are the means that God uses to create faith. Words are words of God. You've been given the ability to speak those words. Truths that you learn right here can be retold by you. People can be saved because you have the ability to share the gospel. And there's many other abilities. The ability to organize, to sing, work with your hands, cook, bake, care for the sick, bring healing, teach, type, write, do art, quilt. And by the way, once again, I did not win the quilt this year. Incredible. Um, <laughs> uh, you, got the ability, you may have the ability to work with numbers, counsel. Hospitality is an ability. It was actually mentioned in the first reading we had today. I saw a list the other day of 500 abilities, a list of 500 things. Some of them I just mentioned, but there's 500. And it's estimated that every single person has at least 50 of them, at least. But we tend to take for granted the ones we've got because they're just part of who we are. We barely notice anymore. But we've got them, and they're all valuable. God's invested heavily in you, like the master giving millions to his servants. But besides your possessions and abilities, the greatest investment God has made in you, without a doubt, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now, who is that? The Holy Spirit is God. He's like, he's like a, a divine flow of life and of power. Let me take a moment to teach about the Holy Spirit. In the opening, the very opening verses of the Bible, the beginning of everything is described, particularly the earth. And it says that the earth was without form. It was void, covered in deep water and darkness. It's like the planet had been created with all this potential. God had put all this potential in it, but nothing's happening yet. It's just dark and formless. Then, the very next verse says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, this is so hopeful and exciting because it's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that can cause all that potential to emerge, to unfold, and bring forth life. The Holy Spirit's hovering over it all, and the very next thing that happens is that God speaks and the Holy Spirit is in this speaking of God's word. The Spirit and the word go together. He's in the speaking of the word and immediately physical light breaks through to the earth. Then continents are formed. It's getting formed. The continents are formed, which sprout vegetation. God speaks more. And every time he does, the Holy Spirit is in it, bringing out more and more of this wonderful potential. Birds are created. Fish fill the seas. Mammals walk upon the earth. Finally, man is created. And God says, breathes into his nostrils. He breathes into him. God's breath or his wind, his spirit. In Hebrew, it's the same word for all those. And it's a picture of man receiving what no other animal has, the spirit of God, but within, within why man? Because man is created to partner with God in continuing to bring out and develop the life-giving potential of the world. 
a vibrant human civilization with all that entails, living in harmony with a fruitful, wonderful earth. However, not long, still in the opening chapters of the Bible, terrible setback. Mankind sinned and went spiritually dead inside. However, God sent the Christ who took that death upon himself on the cross. Christ atoned for the sins of all mankind. And then, by what power? It says by the power of the Holy Spirit, the life-giving Holy Spirit, Jesus rose from the dead. And Christ gives forgiveness of sins now, as you know, and more. He restores in us the indwelling Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, verse 21, this is uh, uh, an account of Easter time. Jesus, freshly risen from the dead, says to his people, as the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus tells us, I'm sending you. And the mission I've got, I'm sending you on that mission. The love I was sent to bring, the service I was sent to do, I am going to continue through you who believe in me. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Are you tracking with me here? God has given us forgiveness and he's commissioned us with the assignment of continuing Christ's redemptive kind of work. And he's given us abilities and he's given us this Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, as you operate in faith, your natural abilities, they become charged with God's life and amazing power. Now you're not just practicing hospitality, but when people come over, they feel somehow the warmth of heaven's welcome when they come through your door. They may not articulate that, but they, they sense it. The difference is not how well you have vacuumed or peeled the potatoes. It is the flow and life of the Spirit just bringing it out. And now, when you reach out to someone in distress, it's not just that they get some direction and help. They're actually comforted. They stop crying. It's not your brilliant choice of words. Again, it's the Holy Spirit, called elsewhere the Comforter, working through you. By the Spirit, you get words from God. By the Spirit, you're empowered to pray with power. Natural abilities, good, but they become what the New Testament calls spiritual gifts. They get charged. Partnering with God in the Spirit, you're able to bring life and potential out from the world that's around you. You haven't got a call to the entire earth, but there's a world around you, and by the Spirit working in you, you can bring its potential for life and goodness out. And it doesn't matter if you are one of our kids down there in Sunday school, or if you are a young family with kids, or you are middle-aged, or you are retired, or old. Partnering with God in the Spirit, you are able to bring life and potential to flourish out from the world right around you, wherever it is you are. Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Is it any wonder that in his parable, Jesus depicted the servants as having millions of dollars invested in them? You and I are those servants. Yeah, you say, but we always try to find a way to complain. But one servant gets five bags of gold, another gets two, and another gets one. Why don't all the servants get the same amount? Okay, well, first of all, remember, even the guy in the parable who received the least, it was still a million dollars. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's putting it mildly. It's huge. However, as for the rest, I don't, I don't know why they did not all receive the same. I don't. However, it's just a fact that as you look around, people are given different abilities. People aren't given the same. They're given different abilities. Actually, I think that's good. Um, and they're given different amounts of ability. And 
different opportunities to serve, not the same. The emphasis of the parable lies not in comparing yourself to others and bemoaning what you don't have, but on getting busy and getting busy at once, doing God's work with the amazing gifts and opportunities that you have received. Here's what he said. He who, he, he who had received the five bags of gold went at once and traded with them, and he made five more. He also, so also he who had the two bags of gold made two more. And then you know what happens with those two servants. When the master returns, they report to him. And what a happy scene that is. He's thrilled with what they've done for him. And he said, even though one has come back with five and one two, he says the exact same thing to both of them. Well done, good and faithful servant. He loves the faithfulness. You've been, a, you've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I can't help noticing that there's no boss's word of criticism or correction here. There's just praise and reward. And when you realize that by way of this parable, Christ is illustrating what will be said to us, to you, when he returns, it's pretty amazing. Christ will return, bringing reward with him. This ought to incentivize us to keep our eye on the ball when it comes to living for God and doing his stuff. Yes, indeed, everyone who truly believes will go to heaven. But in addition to that, those who have served well will be rewarded well. Contrast that other servant. Verse 18 says the master also invested in him a million dollars worth. But he did not go diligently to work with it. Instead, he dug a hole and buried the gold in the ground. You know, why should he go to work and produce all this stuff for the master? Let the master do his own work. He's thinking, I'm going to take care of myself. When the master returns, my plan is just to give him back what he gave me in the first place. Well, the master does come back, not happy about this. Verse 26, he says, you wicked and slothful servant. You ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received it was my own with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who's got ten. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who is not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The overall point of this parable has to do with faithfulness. God's made an investment in you and me, right? Forgiveness, possessions, abilities, the Holy Spirit. And he expects you to be faithful in putting all that to work for his purposes in kingdom. He fully intends to reward you but the one guy was unfaithful. He buried what had been given to him. He probably went around ignoring God and living for his own riches and pleasures. Not only does such a person miss out on their purpose for being on earth and the meaning of life, love and service to others, but their final end is not good. It's all there in Jesus' words. So out of this, I have three action points for you this morning. First, stop thinking of yourself as a failure and start thinking of yourself as forgiven. Forgiven and loved. You've been totally forgiven. The, 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 you're clear to this. So that it's wide open for you to get on with a fruitful life. Second, you've got at least 50 abilities. Think through a dozen of them. They are there. You just got to think them through a little bit and get an idea for how you could use them, maybe develop them and use them to serve others, possibly around here at this church. It's amazing what can happen when people at church with different abilities team up. Great things are done by teams. Third, believe there's a Holy Spirit. 
I, I, I know, as Lutherans, we said, we said I have not have heard much about this. Well, it's there all over the scriptures. Believe that there is a Holy Spirit and believe that in your baptism, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God gave him to you. In prayer now, ask to be filled with him. In prayer, ask this Spirit, who is the Lord, to guide your service and to add divine life and power to your abilities. Then pay attention to what happens after that and thank him. God has made a big, big investment in you and me. He believes in you. And he's excited about what you're going to accomplish for his kingdom. Amen. Now, may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.